So this video follows on from the last video that I made on Trev's blog. If you're not aware of Trev's blog, it's another YouTube channel of mine. If you'd like to go and check that channel out, then there's a link in the video description. You can just click on that link and it'll take you straight to Trev's blog. So anyway, following on from the video in Trev's blog, I'm going to show you the installation of the battery tray and talk a little bit about um, how coffee vans work, how various systems installed into this van makes this van completely off grid. So you could be in the middle of absolutely nowhere, you don't need any gas, you don't need any electricity, it's completely self-sufficient and will run all day long. Even water as well, you know, it's got enough water on board to hopefully be able to serve all day long flat out. That's the plan. Anyway, so I give you a tour of uh, what I've done and take you through the various things that I've had to go through, um, certification and uh, for the RPG and um, uh, electricity and also uh, a boiler pressure test as well. So let's start with the battery tray that left off on the Trev's blog video because that's where I left off on that video was making the tray. I'll just show you it installed and all the systems, how they work, what's going on. This is the battery tray, all clamped down, well and truly secure to the van, lots and lots of nuts and bolts holding it down. It's also got those uprights on it that are holding the inverter and the flow jet pump. So if you're watching this because you sort of want to know a bit more about running an off-grid coffee van, then I'm going to talk you through the system that I've got in place here. Now this, this isn't um, a flawless system. I would do things differently if I did it again. It works very well, but um, I would do things slightly different. So we've got a 70 litre water tank here. Now the water tank is filled up from a filler on the outside of the van. So we've got a filler there, got a pipe going down to the tank. This can be filled up via hose pipe in just a few minutes and then you've got 70 litres of water on board. 70 litres of water to run a commercial coffee machine is a lot of drinks that will probably last the day even if you were really really busy so I really wanted to go for something that was going to be sort of maintenance free once you'd filled it up that was the my thinking behind fitting this large tank to start with so that's why I fitted this large tank I have got a cap lower down now the cap lower down was a mistake initially because this tank was going to be mounted deeper. I wanted this sort of tank almost sort of level with the floor, maybe just a couple of inches up. And the problem is I hadn't really anticipated where the exhaust was going to go and that was the issue. Um, I've got a prop shaft underneath. Mounting it lower probably would have got away with it with the prop shaft but not having the exhaust fitted at the time was an oversight. Fitted the exhaust, tank was in the way. Had to raise the tank up. Raise the tank up, fill a neck too low then to be able to fill it up. So I thought to myself, well, I really could do with a way of emptying this tank out because I don't want to leave water in here. I want to do my day's trading, then take any water that's in there and get rid of it. I don't want sort of stagnant water sitting in a tank. So I've left that in because it's a fantastic way of just siphoning the tank out at the end of the day. So that's why it's got two water caps on the outside. So we've got our 70 litres of water and like I say, there's a good chance that that's going to last all day. I have got some little portable tanks that I can use to top it up with if I need to. So the battery is driving this inverter. Now the battery is a 12 volt leisure battery, 115 hour amp. And it's driving the inverter which is capable of delivering 1500 watts or 3000 watts peak. Now my 
top draw will probably be about nine to a thousand watts absolute flat out with everything running at once which it will never be that so i can add something if i need to it's got it's got plenty of um, it's got plenty of reserve there and that's why i bought that one um so and it all seems to i powered it up and it all seems to work really really well so this flow jet is um a bottled water pump so you see them in receptions in places uh, you go over uh, open up a little tap because this works on a pressure drop as soon as you start taking water out of this output line so you've got this output pipe if you were to break the seal on the output pipe and it was turned on then it would just automatically start pumping so if you had a tap you open the tap you let the pressure out the pipe it knows it starts pumping it's really clever actually this because what it's got is it's got a float on the end so this float goes in the tank and this float on the end look so the float goes up and it's live now when you run out of water in the tank float drops down and cuts the pump off so that it means that it's not trying to pump when you've got no water in there because if it does it'll burn the pump out so I thought that was quite clever. So this pumps the water out of the tank all the way round to a calcium treatment unit which cleans the water. So calcium treatment unit takes the calcium out so that the coffee machine doesn't get all furred up inside. Also makes the water taste a lot nicer. So calcium treatment unit has to be changed every 12 months. They're about £300 to buy and they cost about £100 for a refill afterwards. So not a cheap thing to have but apparently quite essential. I have been warned that there are cheap and cheerful ones that you can buy and I have been told, I don't know because I haven't had any personal experience but people have told me to steer clear of those and to get a proper one so I've got a proper one anyway. so. As I was saying, this battery powers the inverter. This inverter powers the flow jet and it also powers the coffee machine. It won't run the coffee machine if you wanted to run it all electric. So I know people that have done this and they've come unstuck. Um, if you're going to try and run a coffee machine off an inverter, you need a lot of batteries <laughs> and a very, very powerful inverter if you're going to consider doing something. And apparently, it's not it's not really practical in a mobile application. You need so many batteries to ensure that you had enough current there to run the coffee machine. I mean, it's um, I can't remember what it is now. Is it's probably about four kilowatts, five kilowatts or something, the the coffee machine, I think. So a lot of a lot of juice you'd need um you know to run all day. So the coffee machine is LPG. So the element side of the coffee machine is driven from the LPG. Uh, so it's got a gas burner in there to take care of the heating because anything that gets hot consumes a lot of energy. So what they've done for Chino is they've converted the coffee machine to LPG. So you can run it on um, propane um, or LPG, which you can just fill up at the fuel station. This is So this is a, a proper LPG tank as supplied by the company Gasset. Wonderful people. Really, really helpful and really, really taught me through everything that I needed to do. So the tank needs to be fitted in a locker so this has got a door on it the door is over there leaning up against the seat I'll show you it with the door on but I've got half my inspection yet so I'm waiting for the guy to come and look at it in a couple of hours I was up till half 11 last night finishing all this off um, so anyway this LPG tank is filled up from a bayonet fitting on the outside you can fill it up at the petrol station it's got lots of safety built in so you can't overfill this bottle you could just 
you know, pull back the pump, it will just keep pumping until the bottle is 80% full and then it just shut off, it won't let you fill any more in there than that. It's also got a clever little exterior gauge that you just press the button and the gauge tells you how much is left in the tank and that's something else that I bought because obviously when the cover's on you can't see how much is in the bottom. It'd pretty much be guesswork, wouldn't it? So I had, had that gauge as, as an extra. It wasn't much more money to have that and uh, it just means that you can you can tell. It has actually got a a visual gauge on the top so if you had the locker uh, somewhere else and you could open it open up a door say and look in on the top of the tank then you would be able to see and you wouldn't need that but this is something that's just closed away so this gas locker was custom made I had to make this myself because you couldn't buy anything off the shelf that would do the job uh, and this was an enormously difficult task making this a lot lot harder than I thought it was going to be when I first started it anyway so a locker must must have access so that you can remotely turn the gas off so you can isolate the bottle um, you've got to be able to do this in a way that doesn't corrupt the seal so the whole point of this is, is there's a door on here that's got a seal on it, so if that's all sealed in. If that bottle was to leak in any way, it's not going to fill the van full of gas. That's the whole point of this, is so that if, if it does leak, it doesn't get inside the van. Now, if this did leak, the whole point of it is RPG heavier than air, so if it leaks, then it goes downwards and you have a vent in the bottom. So this vent here, vents through the floor, uh, there's a there's a big hole in the side, low down. The other rule stipulation is that it mustn't be under the bottle of the vent because the bottle can obscure the vent. Uh, that's what they say anyway, but I think that's a bit of nonsense myself. I think you could have had a, a very good vent under the bottle, raised the bottle up and had plenty of access around for the gas to flow out. But anyway, that's one of the stipulations and so you know, that, that's why I went along with putting this one in the side, although I have seen them in the floor many times, but again, there's so many gray areas with RPG, it's really, really difficult to get any hard information as to what the right way to go about. And that's why the guys at Gasset were so good because they helped me. We, we talked through this over the phone and very few companies out there would be willing to do that these days, I can assure you of that. So. Anyway, there's the there's the isolation valve on the top, and that's accessed from a lockable flap on the outside. So that flap can be unlocked, and then you put your hand through, and you can just turn the bottle on or, on or off from there without corrupting your seal between the inside of the van and the bottle. So, like I say. If it was to leak, it would go in. It would go inside the van if the cover wasn't on. But the cover's bolted on. I can gain access from the flap and then just simply turn the bottle on or off. And there's no risk of anything escaping out if if something were to happen, which is highly highly unlikely. So you've got this pigtail. This is the fill point here. So that little that elbow there is the fill point, and you've got this pigtail running round to the bayonet fitting which is right by the petrol flap so you can go to the petrol station and fill the bottle up and that's how I've managed to do this um, now I should think there's probably only sort of a fraction of the population that would be interested in this kind of thing but if you were interested I'm sure that this video would be invaluable because I could find no information on YouTube or anywhere regarding this kind of thing so the other thing I invested in as well was this furrow pipe. So this is proper LPG pipe for vehicles. And um, it's much, much better than the ready orangey standard LPG pipe. Um, it's got proper brass ends on there that have to be, yeah, you, know, you need a torque wrench to tighten them up to a specific torque. And I've got a continuous pipe going all the way from the regulator all the way to the coffee machine without a break in now you've only got one join well two joins one at the regulator one at the coffee machine far less to go wrong so 
that's why I fitted that and it's very high spec pipe as well so that's why I fitted that pipe so this high pressure pump gets the water up to pressure to express the coffee through the port filter and I think this will pump up quite high uh, I think I've got it set to about 8 bar now mains pressure is about 4 so uh, this is set to about 8 it'll easily do I've easily had this up to 12 and over so it's um, it does get to very very high pressure and this is driven off the inverter through the coffee machine so the coffee machines powered up and then this is driven off the coffee machine obviously taking its power from the inverter as well but the coffee machine tells it when it needs to run and that is basically it so like I say the inverter and the battery they power the flow jet the high pressure pump the coffee machine the coffee dr grinder and anything else that I feel like I want to plug in obviously you've got to be very mindful of how much power you're taking off so once you start plugging anything in that heats up that's got an element in it you're drawing big power and you're very soon going to exhaust the reserves that you've got there so you can't really run anything that takes up a lot of juice this basically means that the system will run you fill it up with water fill the tank up with gas you could probably sit in a field miles away from any water or anything you know no electric no, nothing needed at all and this fan will be able to serve coffee all day long and that's why i've built it the way i have now i did sort of say about what i would change if i was doing it again and these are the changes i would have made i wouldn't fit that tank i'd do away with this tank and i would have had two or three of the portable 20 litre water containers that I've got. So I possibly would have got a third one. So I've got a couple, I would have bought an extra one and I've had those loose there. I would have had the RPG tank there where that battery is because where I've got it mounted now, although it's in a way it's in a, in a perfect position for the van, but it just means that access into the van is slightly obstructed with with where it is so it's it's narrowed that opening there and it's it's taken out a bit of the access into the back because we've got the we've got the coffee machine in there so that's already taken out half the van and then you've got the rpg this side obscuring a doorway as well Although it, it all works well because we haven't got tons of stock you've got to take anywhere and it, it goes in okay. So, I mean, we've done a few dry runs, you know, loading all the kit in and everything and it's it's not too much of an issue. Um, so, what I would have done, like I say, I would have scrapped the water tank so that water tank wouldn't be there. This LPG locker, I would have had this where the battery is. And the battery would have gone somewhere in the middle and then I would have had the loose tanks just there and I would have had everything just along there no problem at all then I wouldn't have had to have had the exterior filler I wouldn't have had to have any any holes in the side of the van to fill it up and I could have just filled the containers up and dropped them in and then just cha kept changing the ch uh, containers over now this would have been where this system will will be more superior to having the loose tanks because of course 70 litres in this tank and it's just going to keep pumping until all 70 litres goes if you had three containers you'd have 60 litres of water and you'd have to keep on changing it over every time you exhausted the tank which I don't know if you were really really pushed that could become a bit of an issue if you just had to stop mid-service and change the tank over but I think that's probably the way I would have gone rather than doing it this way but you know hindsight is a wonderful thing as you say so that's the only thing I would have done different is there anything else I could talk about I don't think so if you've got any questions ask me I mean I'm not an expert of these things I'm just sort of somebody that's having a go themselves and um, it's all in the planning stage of this thing but when you're talking about vintage vans and converting something to something else it's not as straightforward as it would appear to start with it's um 
it's a real hard thing to turn an old vehicle into you know like a, a shop it's not a straightforward thing I am Andy Ratcliffe from RCM Catering Equipment. We're based in Swindon in Wiltshire. Uh, I've come out to see Trevor today to do the gas testing uh, and some uh, rudimentary electrical testing on this vehicle. Um, you can see it's got a Fracino coffee maker, dual fuel effectively, so this runs on LPG and also runs on electrics. Um, we're doing basic gas testing, so we're looking for, obviously for leaks. LPG is heavier than air, so inside a vehicle particularly it's, uh, it can be dangerous and we're looking to make sure that the basic safety features of this piece of equipment works uh, works properly and works safely, so that'll be the on-off control on here and you've also got the flame failure device which controls uh, exactly as it says, it's a flame failure device so that will control the pilot as long as there's a pilot there, it'll allow gas through and for the appliance to be used safely if that um, flame, uh, flame failure valve isn't working properly it shuts off, won't let anything go through. So in this case, uh, it's a fairly new machine. Both, uh, both of those are working fine. We tested the gas pipe work from the appliance all the way back to the bottle. We've looked at the bottle, we've looked at the pressure regulation and so on and so forth on that, um, and looked at the safety of the pipe work that goes back. In this case, it's all clipped up nicely and tightly. Uh, it's got the right equipment either end of it in terms of seals and so on and so forth, so that is all good. We've also tested um, CO2 output, which is one of the most important things. This is a little vent check uh, device that will check CO2 levels. It's an outside vehicle, it's designed to be working outside, so it's you're never going to get CO2 um, readings that are going to be too high. If this is in an enclosed environment, obviously the CO2 we'd expect to be a lot higher in this case. Uh, the legal limit is 2,800 parts per million. Uh, in this case, I think it's around about 1,100, so well below the limit, and we're in an enclosed environment under testing conditions here as well. So if this is in the outside air, plenty of fresh air ventilation, it won't be a problem at all. And that's basically it. And like I said, I'm Andy Ratcliffe from RCM Catering Equipment. We're based in Swindon, um, available online. If you were thinking about installing LPG in a van to run a coffee machine and this bit of information might be quite good for you. Now I went to see my local council to ask them their opinion and their advice on it all and the useful bit that I gleaned out of the um, out of the meeting was the advice to me was well if you're absolutely hell bent on doing this whatever you do don't fill it up with LPG um, because if it springs a leak then um, then it, it's uh, it could be potentially catastrophic, which I, I kind of I got what they were saying, but you know the logistics of the uh, advice I was getting was completely crazy, you know, because the the guy that's coming to test the RPG had to come from yeah, miles away to come and look at it, and the advice was well, get him to look at your installation first, and if he says it's okay, then fill it with gas, then get him back down again again to check it again to make sure it's not leaking so anyway I thought about it and I thought I wonder if there's a pipe available for you to be able to fill the bottle up from another another unit and I started looking online and I found this pipe now this pipe has got it's got an LPG fitting on the one end, tank fitting, so that screws into a standard, not LPG, I keep saying that, propane. So that screws into a propane tank, uh, left-handed thread, screws straight into the propane tank. Now the other end has got the screw thread that fits into the bayonet fitting on the refillable LPG tank which means that you can have a completely empty tank in the van you can then attach a completely full propane bottle to that tank and then just turn it on temporarily and because it's just taking the gas off the top it's not actually pumping in liquid petroleum it's just taking off at the gas what it does is it pressurizes the tank with just gas inside the van Till it finds its own pressure level uh, which doesn't take long and um, then of course you can then test the bottle inside the van without actually filling out with liquid petroleum so that was one real positive thing that came out of that meeting what i've also done is bought this fill point extender just simply screws in 
to the field point on the van and extends it outside of the van because of course this is recessed in here and I was wondering whether I'd actually be able to get the filler at the fuel station on and I can actually but it's a very very tight fit and I may be in a position where I go somewhere and it's got a slightly different fitting um, you know like the guns the same fitting obviously but um, it won't go inside as well because from time to time I understand they actually change the um, the actual handheld piece at the fuel station so that's something else I thought was well worth getting it massively increases the access you'd be able to have also if you were thinking of building something yourself and I mean you could have a tiny little cap that big so you could have something say as small as a fuel cap you could have a plug somewhere pull the plug out get the extender screw it into the hole and then you haven't got a you haven't got a big flap like this you know so that's something else that you know you might think about um, it was sort of something I was kind of toying with myself but as I had the fuel cap here anyway I just made sense to me to put it all in the same same area so that's why I've done it like this so that was the LPG well the mobile LPG certification taken care of so I'm making this video because there's such a lack of this kind of information on the internet uh, particularly on YouTube couldn't find anything at all when I was looking I don't know whether there is anything on there now but I thought I'd just make this video to help people out that were kind of considering setting up like a mobile catering unit coffee van whatever I'll tell you all the things that both myself and my wife have been through uh, so that you can sort of you know make your own mind up uh, and you'd be better informed before you even start going down the path you know if you're just like kind of considering it I do get approached quite often by somebody sort of saying that they want to dip their toe into this they don't want to go they don't want to go all out they just want to have a little dabble at it you know so they've got an old van and they want to buy a coffee machine so that their daughter can have a go you know at the weekends in a market or something like that then I don't think this is really feasible at all um, and that's the short answer I would give to anybody that was making that kind of inquiry to me and I'll give you the long version of why why I don't think it's feasible now really so like I say you got the LPG you got the mobile RPG certificate which is uh, quite a hard thing to actually find somebody that does the correct one because it's got nothing to do with household gas this is a completely different thing altogether so you've got to have that done uh, so that you've got to have the certificate and all these things I'm talking about it's an annual thing you know every every year you have to have this redone again so you've got the costs of all this every single year so you've got to have that done anything with a plug that's electrical that plugs into anything has got to be pat tested so electrically pat tested so that's that if you've got a, a boiler, anything that boils water that holds pressure, um, so coffee machine, it's got a boiler in it. Every single year you have to have a pressure test done. It's a pressure systems safety regulations 2000 category 1 certificate. You have to have that done every single year. Uh, the calcium treatment unit for the water purification side of things with the coffee machine has got to be replaced every year. Um, and I've, you've got your insurances, so you've got public liability insurance, uh, which was uh, five million pounds worth of public liability, which isn't that big a deal actually. Probably only costs around about hundred pounds a year for that. The insurance to actually drive the van on the road and operate it as a business was a different thing. That was about seven or eight hundred pounds. Of course, every year you got to have that done. Uh, I think all the sort of you know like the pressure tests and the RPG and the pat tests and everything else I think that came in uh, around about ooh, about sort of I can't remember off the top of my head five six hundred pounds for that calcium treatment you know unit was about a hundred pounds a year it's just try and build in some idea of what you're what you'd be letting yourself in for 
um, so that you'd be legal to be able to actually trade. You've got to consider all this, you know. There's no point sort of going into this kind of thing half-heartedly or either all in or you're all out, really, I think, anyway. So the other requirements you have to have is you'd have to have your um, premises or your house or wherever you're going to be preparing food or working with food, you have to have you know, you have to come contact your local authority, nip down your local council, go and have a chat with them. The Revers are helpful actually. Um, they give you a pack called the Safer Food Better Business Pack. And there's a lot of good tips and things in there. Uh, and what they need to do is come down to wherever you prepare food and they want to go through everything. And it's not just a case of them having a quick look round just to make sure you've kept things clean and tidy. Is a lot more to do with paperwork, uh, a lot of things to do with your opening up and closing down processes, uh, documentation, you know, you've got to document absolutely everything and you've got to show that you're keeping everything at the correct temperatures, uh, you know, obviously using food within the correct dates and everything else. So you need to know all this and you need to show that you're documenting it and doing it properly. Anyone also that's having anything to do with handling food also has to have a level 2 food safety and hygiene certificate. This is an online course which will take you about 3 hours of your time, not hugely expensive, probably costs around about 20-ish pounds, can't remember off the top of my head again. Uh, the local authority coming around doesn't cost any. Make sure you know what you're talking about when they come down and be prepared for them because at the end of the day they give you your hygiene level rating and you really want to try and get a level 5 rating if you can. Um, obvious, for obvious reasons really, you don't want people um, looking upon your business and sort of frowning upon your very low rating. And the other thing as well is, um, is when you apply for some of the events so if you go to an event organizer they'll, they'll often ask you what your food hygiene rating is because they want people with high food hygiene ratings to go into their events so it's all it's all really important this stuff this is stuff that you've got to take seriously and you, you've got to put the legwork in otherwise you won't get you know you won't get the result you're looking for um, with regards to uh, events and pitches and, and, and things like that um, I'll talk very briefly, um, like I say you really need to go and sort of look into this all yourself but I'm giving you a, you know, as much as an honest overview as I possibly can. So if you're looking at council side of things, so you, could or you can apply for a street traders license and I haven't gone into this myself but you can apply for a day's street traders license or you can go for a proper pitch. So there's two different types. So let's just say you wanted to do something and it was only going to be for a day. Then you would have to pay something like 125-ish pounds to apply. So that's just the application fee. Then you apply, then they have a meeting and they decide whether or not they're going to let you do it and how much they're going to charge you for the day. Now, as far as I'm concerned, this is a, a non-starter because of the huge costs involved in just trading for a day with a coffee van. It's just... It's just not really feasible, is it? It's not going to happen. Um, but you know, you, you have to kind of understand that we live in this sort of world now where everybody's suing each other and making a big deal about absolutely nothing. So this is the knock-on effect. You know, we we have to go through all these processes and make sure everybody's safe and nobody's going to get sued and everything else. So reading between the lines, this is what a lot of it's got to do with. The, the other thing is like a pitch, so you'd have a street trader's license for a pitch in town, say say you had a, a town centre, um, some of these pitches could be thousands of pounds, uh, but basically you'd be like a shop operating from the town, you could turn up every day and, and trade from there, and uh, it would be something I'd really, really like to sort of have a crack at, um, maybe, I don't know something to think about for the future but that's something that we were sort of talking about myself and my wife talking about doing something like that anyway um uh the other way is obviously event organizers um as far as the street traders license is concerned if it's on private ground you don't need one and 
if it's run by an event organiser, so it, it could be on the streets, so the council would most certainly be involved in this, but what would happen is, is the event organiser, they would apply for street traders licence on everybody's behalf, so they would get it squared off with the council, so that the council knew that it was being operated and run and managed properly and then they would allow them to have a street traders license for that day and then all the you know private companies would all roll up and operate their mobile businesses you know on that day in that in that place and that's how that works that's why you don't need to have a street traders license for a private event you know that's organized by a proper event organizer so that's about it. I think I've covered everything I wanted to say, and I've, like I say, I, I've, I've sort of made this video really because there didn't seem to be anything on there when I was looking into it, nothing I could find that I sort of found very useful really. So obviously since many of the parts of this video were shot, a lot has changed since then. I mean, some of these bits that you've just seen were actually shot, of course, in 2019 before we were fully aware of everything that was going to happen. Now our first event was going to be on Christmas Day and um, that's what the massive panic to try and get all the um, certificates sorted out was, was all about. So we really really worked hard uh, to get that done and our first event which was going to be at the Cheltenham Lido on Christmas Day unfortunately it was so wet we couldn't get into the car park. Now um, not the car park, sorry, we couldn't get into the grounds. Now, the Lido said that, um, well, if we can't get you into the grounds, then we could put some bollards around and you could go in the car park, which we were quite happy about. And then we got wind that the council actually owned the car park. So I contacted the council and told them what the situation was. And they said that um, I needed a street trader's license. Well, the day was only going to be an hour long, so we decided to not apply for the license. So that was our first event cancelled straight away. Um, after that, our great friends who own the Biblin's Tea Garden in the heart of the Forest of Dean, they very kindly went to the Forestry Commission and asked permission for us to be able to trade just kind of outside their shop, but in the campsite there and they, they agreed to that which was really really nice but of course the weather then took a turn for the worse we had horrific floods and the little pitch where we would have been was 10 feet under water so we couldn't do that either we had we had five chances of that so basically we missed six opportunities our next opportunity would have been at the Tithe Barn in Bishop's Cleave and um, right up until the day before we were due to go, uh, even though we were aware of the coronavirus, the event was still going ahead. And then I think it was actually, it was the Friday. It was, it was happening on the Sunday and then on the Friday we received an email to say, no, it's all off now. It's all off. So that was a bit of a blow because, of course, we'd stocked up on everything. Coffee, hot chocolate, tea, um, bought all the ingredients to make the cakes everything was all you know done and dusted we were all ready to go and then of course the plug was pulled right at the last minute so very very unfortunate and of course now we it, it's looking more and more certain that this year will probably be completely cancelled the one small event that we did do which was uh, really fantastic was a free event for our neighbors so basically um, the people that just live, live around us, we hired the church hall and went in the car park, just invited the neighbours around, sort of more of a way of an apology more than anything else because of all the racket I've made over the last few years. So if you've seen videos of us trading, it wasn't actually us trading at all, it was just this kind of event for the neighbours. So if you were a bit confused by us not doing anything, well that was the thing that we did do. So, But it was great, it was a brilliant day and uh, it gave us a taster of things to come and um, it was it was really enjoyed by everybody that attended and everyone had sort of real positive comments to make and the fact that it, it kind of worked and it all looked right as well which was something that I was quite concerned about because of course setting up in the garage it's completely different uh, to what things are going to look like I haven't got enough space in here to actually stand back and have a look 
and that event was the first time that I could set the van up and actually get a few feet back from it and look at it as a whole sort of finished product you know and I could look at it and say yeah fair play that looks that looks really smart it doesn't look it doesn't look ridiculous I was a bit concerned that it would look a bit odd with sort of half van half sort of marquee sort of thing you know so anyway it looks I think it looked good and everyone else was uh, very complimentary about it so that was that was a real high point in the in the whole sort of year that we've had so far we mustn't lose heart and we've got to keep on because we've got no other choice so what we'll continue to do is we'll continue to do videos that hopefully are going to entertain some people Tracy still wants to do her baking we're going to try and set up a, a shop which we're in the process of doing right now and um, that's going to be an online shop selling uh, our bakes our hot chocolate and and things like that um, lots of different things that Tracy's thinking about doing online of course it's not quite what we wanted to do but it's a way of keeping the spark still alive so anyway um, look forward to those baking tutorials as well of Tracy so she'll keep doing those kinds of things so anyway I hope you enjoyed the video sorry it's a bit doom and gloom at the end but it just can't be helped can it we just gotta keep our chins up keep on going and um, until next time I'll say bye for now